guys, it's Jason Minardi with Group 9. Our group is doing the Maillard reaction for our first video, and so you're going to see us um, cooking different types of foods and kind of explaining how the uh, what the Maillard reaction is and how it applies to those foods. Okay, so just a basic overview of the Maillard reaction. The Maillard reaction is the uh, amino acids and the sugars in different foods. Um, they react and create uh, other compounds which are responsible for like the flavors, the smells, things along those lines, and it also causes the browning um, or your foods to brown. Okay, so with uh, bacon specifically, science has discovered over 150 uh, different um, compounds that are responsible for the smells, the aromas, and um, uh, the flavors of bacon. So uh, we're going to go uh, now. The optimal temperature to uh, the, for the Maillard reaction to actually start is above 285 degrees. And so we're actually going to cook bacon this morning, and we're going to kind of watch some of these different reactions. And I'm going to go over some of the different um, compounds that were kind of uh, th that are responsible for the smells and whatnot. Okay, so we've got a pan of bacon here. And uh, I'm, I'm cooking it a little bit different than I normally do. I'm going to actually do it in the oven because I wanted to show that we've got the oven uh, set at 300 degrees. And so uh, we're going to set this in here because the Maillard reaction starts after uh, temperatures reach over 285 degrees. So it's only been about two minutes and we're already starting to kind of see the effects of the Maillard reaction here. So we can see the bacon, um, the grease is starting to come out, so the amino acids and the um, sugars in the bacon are starting to uh, react to uh, each other, starting to make the, um, and starting to smell like bacon too. You can actually start to see some of the heat come off of it right now. But um, the, there's three compounds that are really uh, responsible for the, the, the smell of bacon, and that's pyridines, um, pyrazines, and furanes. I, I hope I said that right. But, um, now there's one one compound that it gives bacon its flavor. It, it kind of makes it stand out over some other other meats because those three compounds that I mentioned to you are kind of um, the responsible for most meat flavors, um, and that's nitrates. And so the nitrates in bacon um, are kind of is what gives it its flavor. Okay. All right. After about 15 minutes. Uh, this is the uh, end result of the Maillard reaction in bacon. So it's all brown and it's ready to eat. Welcome to the meat part of the Maillard reaction. Today I'll be demonstrating how this piece of meat is going to end up turning brown because of the Maillard reaction. As you can tell, the Maillard reaction is in effect. The meat has started to brown and as well it's throwing off all these great smells. But what's happening inside there is the amino acids are starting to react with sugary compounds which has turned this meat into brown. And the heat contributes a lot. The best temperatures to keep the meat at is between 230 and 340 degrees Fahrenheit. And thanks to the Maillard reaction, steak is uh, ready to Hi, eat. Hi, my name is Aria Bugage, and I'm going to show you in this segment of the Maillard reaction about popcorn. I'm going to talk about the roasted popcorn aroma. This is before all the flavorings that are added to it. This is basically popcorn, naked popcorn basically. So roasted popcorn aroma, it has two acetyl and one pyroline compounds that helps give it that nice aroma. There's also the, the fatty fried aroma, the, that, that smell you get, get hit with immediately. That makes you know that it's that it's, you know, popcorn. That has two enaminal compounds, four decadineal compounds, and two furfurial thiol bleh, as compounds. And that last one actually has like a, a coffee-like smell if you, um, if you have it isolated. But since it's not isolated in the popcorn, it helps add to that fatty fried smell. For the butter flavored popcorn, you could add two things. You could add two to three butanidone or diacetyl compounds or two to three pentanedione compounds. It really all depends on the type of butter, how much it was. it is. It could 
it, it really all depends in the very end for any flavoring how much is in it or what different what different uh, seasonings or whatever has been added. About 83% of Americans drink coffee and you might have wondered why the aroma and taste of coffee can be so different in different places or why it can be so appealing when you smell it. Everyone knows, I think, that the coffee bean, or it's actually a seed, is a green bean that really has no flavor or aroma when you see it raw before it's roasted. Um, but of course, as it roasts, and the temperature gets higher, the, there's different flavors that go along with that depending on the roast, like medium roast or a blonde roast or a really dark roast. Um, obviously, from a blonde roast to a dark roast, the temperature is hotter and the cracking of the bean, um, it cracks more and it darkens. Um, there are hundreds of chemical reactions, and a few of those are the decomposition of sucrose, the loss of water, a decomposition in protein, and there is a formation of melanoids, which actually gives it the color that it has. And as a result of all those reactions, the aromatics, the acids, and the, and the other flavor components are actually created. And they're either balanced or they're altered in a special way to build the perfect flavor of coffee uh, and taste and body of coffee that each person might like. Uh, a key reaction for the development of roasted coffee and its flavor is the Maillard reaction. And at the temperature of 150 to 200 degrees Celsius, carbonyl groups from sugars, amino acids, and proteins react to form the aroma and flavor compounds. And it's all part of Maillard chemistry. So coffee is just one of the many things. And in this video, you've seen other um, foods that also are products of Maillard reaction and the chemistry that's involved.